your moderator today, our one and only executive director of the Society of Collision Repair Specialists. I'd like to introduce Aaron Schulenberg. Well, good morning. I want to say thank you to everybody for your patience this morning. We are so excited about the program that we have today. And like anything good in life, it is worth waiting for. So um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time introducing. I will say that a focus on emerging trends in the automotive space couldn't be more critical for collision repairers right now as the level of sophistication of the vehicles that we work on escalates and the sophistication expected from our collision repairers uh, in, increases. Um, so I think that the four folks that we have on this first panel for you are going to touch on all the things that you need to know about how vehicles are evolving, where they're going, and what you need to be thinking about in your businesses. So first up is our dear friend, Mr. John Warniak. John is the Vice President of Vehicle Technology here for SEMA. He has 25 years in the aerospace, racing, and automotive industries. Just a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience. He's a founding member of the SAE Connect to Car Conference. And in 2019, just this year, he was elected as a fellow uh, to the SAE for his contributions in the automotive sector. And with that, I'd like to welcome John Warniak. Thank you. First thing I'll do is get this off air and level there. That's better. Welcome to SEMA 2019. How many first time SEMAs here? Good. Got a lot to cover. We're going to shorten this up a bit as uh, Aaron said. We'll probably get, you know, go through maybe 1030 or so if you got the time. Stick around, please. A couple things. As Aaron said, we want to focus on the emerging trends. Have you, how many sessions have you had here today or, or uh, this week, Aaron? We've had a whole session track going in. We have one at 1 o'clock this afternoon, which is our ADAS forum. Aaron, Barry have participated on Kai Young will be on it this afternoon. Where we're going to focus on the technology of this. But today I wanted to focus early morning on the trends and what deep customization is doing. Because a collision repaired vehicle and an aftermarket modified vehicle are like cousins. We need both. We're learning so much from Aaron, from ETI, from all of our associations. I'm going to talk a bit about that. But we're bringing that together to build best practices, common procedures, and collect one voice for the industry, collision repaired, aftermarket modified, back to SAE and into the channel through NHTSA and to the OEM. So a couple of things. The five big mega trends driving, certainly urbanization, climate change, where the cars cause it or not, I don't care. It matters to the millennials, the people that are our future. And if you listen to uh, Greta Thunberg, anybody remember her? 16-year-old who went to the United Nations. She represents that generation, that demographic, that psychographic so well that even if we don't believe in climate change, they do. So take that for exactly for what it's worth and focus on that. Certainly the global economic power shifts, we got emerging markets, et cetera. The demographic combined with that social change and the climate change. But today we're going to talk about the technology stuff. And I mentioned a couple of companies there. Techstars Mobility, one of the best business incubators, accelerators in the country. Baidu, certainly the Chinese Google, if you will, and Hackrod. I'll talk a little bit about Hackrod, and we'll go into more depth with some of that. Uh, SEMA's roots. Nobody was here in 1963. That's the first show on the right. 1963, under the bleachers at Dodger Stadium. Those 13 companies, actually Iskey is giving a presentation right now, 93 years old. He was the CEO of SEMA at the time, but SEMA was the speed equipment manufacturers, not the specialty equipment market. And you look at the hot rod movement, we're going to talk about that because that is what started SEMA. And when people started going faster, that's why they started getting into collisions. That's why we all exist. So take a look at this video. There we go. Beyond Thank just you. cool, the automobile has been a cornerstone of man's ingenuity, mythology, and fascination. You guys ready? It magically captures the ideals of freedom and inventiveness that drove us straight into and through a remarkable industrial age. The birth of assembly lines, mass manufacturing, and the Model T Ford put a blank canvas in the driveways of everyday America. At the end of World War II, a generation of Americans returned home with the taste of danger and excitement along with newfound skills forged by operations of the industrial war machine. Everyday life seemed to run at half speed to these young men and women. They had the power to change this. Regular cars could be stripped down to the bare essentials. And using the mechanical skills learned during the war, motors could be hopped up to deliver high performance to these lighter frames. Soon, all across America, 
These backyard innovators were redesigning and modifying 30 years of mass manufactured metal to produce lightweight, stripped down, and incredibly fast cars. Each creation an individual expression of form follows function and aggressive performance ideals. Now let's move on and join the real speed boys of the desert. At El Mirage Dry Lake, those hopped up cars may look like a familiar old jalopy, but their innards have been streamlined and given a shot of motorized adrenaline. A hot rod was born. Hot Rodders were the original vehicle hackers. They rescued the automobile from racing into a dull future of generic mass production anonymity by embracing deep customization and radical creativity. They drove what they wanted because they made what they wanted, and they drove fast. What started out as an unruly and dangerous form of racing on the dry lake beds of Southern California rapidly became a highly organized sport of drag racing. With top of lap time on our Condec clocks, a 9.12. These weekend warriors worked to give their cars any advantage possible over the competition. It was never enough for the average teenage gearhead to simply be fastest. He needed to be coolest. Modifications like chop top, big and little wheel and tire combos, and stripped down, smoothed out aerodynamic bodywork became de rigueur across America. As young people created their idea of what was cool, with easily accessible raw materials discarded in the junk piles of a rapidly industrialized nation. These mechanical innovators became leading lights in mainstream American motorsports. It wasn't long before the major motor manufacturers were mining this ever-evolving youth culture for ideas and peddling furiously to keep up with the visual language of the hot rod vernacular. Hey, you got a bitchin' car. Somewhere in a place where self-taught mechanics collided with beat culture, the coolest cars on the planet were created in the garages of innovators and makers, changing the car industry forever. Cool, thanks. Can we go back to the PowerPoint? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Good. I wanted to show that because you realize the performance movement, if you will, and a lot of the racing, the genesis of racing in the U.S. particularly, didn't start in Detroit. Didn't, certainly didn't start in Silicon Valley. They were known for farming prunes at the time. It started because of a culture. And that's what really drives a lot of the trends I think we're going to see, particularly with ADAS and the repair of ADAS equipped vehicles, et cetera. We stopped going faster at the brickyard, in this case at Indy, in 1993. We don't need to go faster. We need to get smarter because the cars are getting smarter. And our shops have to get smarter. We have to get smarter about the procedures for repairing a vehicle equipped with ADAS, which is right in front of us. And it will not be stopped. Even if the OEMs are miles ahead of the rest of the industry with ADAS deployment, we still need to fill that gap as fast as we can. We announced the Indy Autonomous Challenge, and that was very polarizing. How many folks believe that the, there should be autonomous vehicles on the roads today? I want autonomous roads. It's coming no matter what. ADAS is the gateway to it. Very polarizing. The first race will be in two years at Indy. If you remember the DARPA challenge, which spawned the whole ADAS and automated and autonomous driving movement, this is the son of DARPA, is what I would call it. So take a look. Go to the site. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, we had the Simon Pagano Indy 500 champ. Uh, a lot, again, very polarizing. We had lots of racers. The heads of racing from the OEs around the panel. We announced it, et cetera. It's very different, but the point is it's not about taking the driver out of the loop, or in this case, the racer out of the loop. It's about the technology that will be on board the cars. So we're a long ways from an autonomous vehicle being parked in any of our driveways. We'll see them in the fleets, certainly in a few years. But the point is the technology will accelerate at warp speed, like we're already seeing with ADAS. An automated vehicle's got to do three things very well. Not 98, not 99 percent, 99 and 10 nines reliability. It's got to see, it's got to think, and it's got to act. And all that has to come together seamlessly and better than a human driver can do it. So we're quite a ways from that. And these are the most technology complex things, if you will, that have ever been deployed in the auto industry since the beginning of the auto industry. So make no mistake, this thing is not easy. The Boeing 777 I flew here from Detroit on, Two million lines of software code. It's a lot of software. A typical car today has 50 to 100 million lines of software code. It's 25 to 50 times more than the most advanced passenger aircraft today. 
If you look at that top shelf there, I stole the slide from the fastest Indian. That's what SEMA started off. That's what a lot of us are probably familiar with, camshafts, heads, things like that. Look at that lower shelf. It's not offerings to the gods of speed anymore. It's offerings to the gods of autonomy. We have Mercer Grad do here. If you look at that lower shelf, you got NVIDIA graphic processing units. Car is not a computer on wheels. There's ECUs, et cetera. But really what, how it sees is through the GPU, the graphics processing unit with NVIDIA. You got the Velodyne LiDAR. You're going to hear a lot about that from Mercer. You got the Mobileye computer. Mobileye started here 19, or I'm sorry, 2008 was the first time they exhibited at the SEMA show. And look what they, how far they've come. Probably the most standard camera and quite a few other things that they help usher in that movement that we talked about. This afternoon, Bobby Hambrick, the founder of Autonomous Stuff, will be on the ADAS forum. That's where people go to build 90% of these vehicles. All the stuff you see in that lower shelf you can get from Bobby's distribution center in Chicago, Illinois. Waymo, Apple, they're all going to, they're building these. And a lot of the racers are taking these parts and building autonomous vehicles that race at Thunder Hill the first Saturday of every month. 40 people show up with all these autonomous vehicles that they're going for track times and uh, algorithms for drifting to really figure out the friction coefficient so that an autonomous vehicle can take advantage of the tires and the suspension, the frame, et cetera. So a lot of technology happening fast. And then certainly electrification, one of the biggest trends that impacts everything we talked about in those five megatrends. Climate, social, everything is happening there. Rivian, I'm hoping that they uh, will be here next year. Their adventure vehicles are phenomenal. And look at the partners they have, Amazon. So it's going to go right into the fleets with that. Certainly Ford partnered with them as well, $500 million worth to license the first Ford electric pickups that they'll have and Cox Automotive to distribute them. ADAS is right in the middle. The five levels of autonomy, we're basically at zero, one, and two at the most. And what's happening with the automotive uh, industry particularly, they're all branding safety performance. There's 12 different versions and definitions of blind spot indicator. We're all wrestling with that. Fortunately, SAE, new standard coming out, 1J DOC is 3063, to commonize the definitions of a lot of the ADAS systems we're working on. As I mentioned, there's 12 different versions and combinations of things that they call the blind spot indicator, forward collision warning sensor, et cetera. We need to standardize that. And 3063 is going to have two versions of it, one for consumers to understand ADAS and the automated driving, and the second for the technicians and the engineers in the world. First time they've done that. And we've joined that Motor Vehicle Council on those uh, ADAS and those definition standards committees within SA. Sadly, we have to have this technology, safety performance. Over the course of this hour and a half or so, 525 people will be severely injured. 4.6 of our friends or strangers will die on our US roads. 92% of those are caused by human error. And I know no one in this room needs any of these systems, right? You're not gonna cause an accident. It's the person next to you, beside you, behind you. That's what it is. 60% of these collisions can be prevented just by the ADAS technology we have today. Powerful stuff, that's why we have to return a vehicle back to ADAS compliant the way it came from the factory after it's been in a collision or after it's been modified. The stuff works, IIHS, great metric there from last year, reducing some of these collisions, deaths by 40%. With distracted driving and uh, the latest statistic, it's going down even more, which is great. And that's just 37 to 40,000 in the U.S. 1.2 million people die yearly around the world. That's, that's a lot. That's the equivalent of two 737s falling out of the sky every week. No society will put up with that. So we need to fix that, and we need to fix it right. SEMA's intersection, what I'll call cars and car culture, CES intersection of cars and technology, shows like Detroit are the intersection of cars and consumers. We need all three. We need the technology, the culture, and the consumers coming together. And we need shows to do that. We need forums like this. One of the best things you've done here is by being here to get this knowledge. And thanks to Aaron and all the SCRS folks for putting this together. This is really where we're going because no one is smart enough or rich enough to do this alone. No association, no company, guaranteed. So we've put together a cross-association industry collaboration. We've got ETI, as I mentioned, AASA, certainly us, MEMA, SCRS, actually Aaron and Barry and Kai, 
They were the first. We started this 10 years ago, the collaboration. SCRS has organically grown within SEMA here and is the prototypical association collaboration. Great opportunity for all of us here. And certainly SAE and ICAR and learning from there. Uh, my previous days, I was one of the founders of No Fear. I put that kind of graphic up there because collaboration isn't easy. The best way I would describe it is a breakfast of ham and eggs. The chicken is involved, but the pig is committed to that. <laughs> You've got to be committed to collaboration. It's not easy. It is a new best practice. You don't know all this, everything. You can't possibly know it all. And what I've told the SEMA community, years ago we started this with Aaron and Barry, I called it the Big Brother Business Model. If you modify that vehicle, but you don't have the DTC ca scanning capabilities, et cetera, alignment like Hunter, et cetera, take it over to your friend that has the collision repair capabilities and join together and make sure that that aftermarket modified vehicle is put through the same procedures as a collision repaired vehicle, and that's better for everyone. We raise the bar for the industry. Fortunately, none of these ADOS systems are regulated yet. <laughs> it will come. Maybe the next administration, currently right now the administration says, let's get our information for NHTSA from SAE, which is great. And Mercha helped lead a lot of that when he was president chairman of SAE for uh, 2018. So we're getting real close to that. The point I want to make, and I mentioned culture drove a lot of this, cars in our lifetime are still works of art, access, power, fashion, fun, and certainly the mobility. You can't fake true cool. So we will still have cars as a hobby. You may not be able to race them or drive them on public roads 100 years from now, but there will be tracks you can take them to, et cetera. So the car is a hobby, and as Louis Chevrolet said there, it's, it's the universal language of freedom. It's gonna continue happening. As part of this, I'm gonna wrap it up. I wanna show you literally what I think the future is going to impact all of us. We had Mouse McCoy here yesterday with Carla Balo, and we called it Auto 4.0, a step into the future. Everything is changing, not just the technology on the cars, but how the technology folds into making cars. And take a look at this video. Imagine that you could design and build the car of your dreams as easy as playing a video game. The Hackrod digital manufacturing platform is connecting virtual reality with artificial intelligence and advanced manufacturing to make this dream a reality. To prove this out, we started by sketching La Bandita, the car that we wanted, but nobody made. Quickly moving from sketch to full-scale photoreal 3D model in virtual reality. allowing us to perfect the design and aerodynamics digitally. Moving back into the physical world and connecting with the Internet of Things, we deployed sensors and scanners to capture 50 years of automotive knowledge. harvested massive data sets and used them to teach the artificial intelligence generative design engine what a car experiences. With artificial intelligence and machine learning, we have the power of hundreds of engineers at our fingertips, allowing us to grow optimized engineering solutions for our design requirements. These designs are too complex and expensive for traditional manufacturing. They have to be 3D printed. Hackrod is leading the way in large scale metal 3D printing. This is the challenge section. It's that node right there that's really gonna make or break this chassis. What we're doing right here, like this is the key. Right, right, right. If we can get that node, then we can get everything. We are now ready to print a full-scale car in aluminum. 
La Bandita is not a concept car. It's a proof of concept of an entirely new way to design and manufacture. And if you can build a car this way, you can build anything. I wanted to show that Mouse was here yesterday and showed some of the things that they're doing. And the equivalent of that is what like Mark Royce describes as the new Corvette, the digital vehicle architecture. Anyone familiar with that? That's exactly the same thing what Mouse is doing to build a vehicle. That's what Mark calls recasting the sports car genre, if you will. Plugging into that digital vehicle architecture. It's on board the new Corvette they unveiled here Monday. That architecture will be part of every General Motors vehicle. So they're going to get smarter. So if you take the AI, artificial intelligence, mixed reality that's coming into building the vehicle, that's what's going to be on board the vehicle as well. So a lot of the ADAS calibration, recalibration, some of the things that Aztec's doing, Drew Technologies and others, that's where it's going to go. It's going to be able to rethink itself and the algorithms, the car will get smarter each time. And this isn't a one-time thing where it comes in and gets calibrated after a collision or after it gets modified. There may be things like smog check, could become ADAS check. A, a certified used vehicle? Did it go through the documentation procedures to make sure all the ADES systems are compliant? Things of that sort. So the point is, tremendous business opportunities for every one of us in this room. This couldn't be brighter time for the automotive industry. Very good stuff happening. Some of the key takeaways, I just want to wrap it up. The gamification of engineering is leading a lot of this. The digital platforms I mentioned. The augmented reality, the virtual reality, the mixed reality. If you get a chance to get involved with any of that, that is what's driving particularly the next generation. Some of this stuff is being taught in schools, but a lot of it is through gamers. Gamers that are designing the next level. STEAM is the future. Science, technology, engineering, art, and math. That's where it is. And the art is arguably the only right-brained skill out of that. The rest can be learned through algorithms, but we need all of them to come together. The digital tools, obviously, we'll be talking about that. Startups are colliding with traditional players like LiDAR, you can hear from Mercha, Velodyne coming from aircraft into automotive. Uh, future factories are driving a lot of that, how they develop, and as I mentioned, Auto 4.0. Probably I want to leave you with this. Anybody remember the Falcon Heavy that was launched last year by Tony Stark? I mean Elon Musk. <laughs> He literally launched that. I think it's pretty close to the sun right now. That's the kind of inspiration we need for this next generation and for us today to get this right. We can do this. The technology's there. It's the human behavior aspect that we're going through. Just like the hot rodders defined an era and an attitude, so too will ADAS and things we're talking about at this great conference here with the OEM Technology Summit. If you notice on the dashboard there, I'm part of what I call the Hot Wheels generation. Tony Stark put that little tiny Hot Wheels on that car, so that, that is real. And this is actually a satellite shot they took of the car going towards the sun. So be inspired. The future belongs to the prepared. I know that's the theme that Aaron and Barry and Kai put together for us here. Be prepared, get prepared, that's why you're here. Thank you. Aaron? <laughs> All right, one more round of applause for John Warniak, please. Okay, um, up next, so John talked a lot about emerging trends and, and big picture items. I think we also want to get technical with you all and give you some insight into the actual work that's being done between automakers and vendors that they count on to help them in design and development of the vehicles that we're going to be working on. Um, the next person that we're, that we're bringing up is the Chief Technology Officer for Material Sciences Corporation, and we met him at the Great Designs in Steel Conference uh, earlier this year. Um, Matt Murphy, uh, his job and his company's job is to bring concepts to an OEM approved level in risk inverse averse environments. And I think what he's going to share with you is going to be exceptionally interesting. Um, so we'll get his slides up. And Matt, if you can come join us, Matt Murphy. Okay, so good morning. My name is Matt Murphy. I'm also from Detroit. Um, I work for Material Sciences Corporation. And what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to give you a few of the topics. Uh, one is the changes in vehicle body design. That's where I spend most of my time, uh, specifically with respect to materials that are selected. The vehicles are becoming a lot more complex, and I'm going to explain what is driving this because it's basically what 
is causing uh, probably 50 to 60 percent of the automotive suppliers have changed their their way of thinking now from uh, historical to more lightweighting focus, more efficient focus. Everyone seems to have a technology or is focused on a way to, to make vehicles more efficient, reduce carbon footprint. If you don't, then uh, if your product isn't lighter or more efficient, uh, you probably have a limited uh, scope of where you can go in the future. So I'm going to explain uh, from our perspective what's driving this. Uh, I'm going to give a couple examples. Ford happens to be a very good customer of ours, so I have several uh, uh, recent examples of, uh, of applications of very new innovative materials that we have brought to new Ford vehicles. Okay. So, so first, and the other point I want to mention is nothing in this presentation is confidential. It's all available uh, uh, online or it's, it's publicly available. Uh, what makes my job very, very challenging is that the automotive industry, generally speaking, is very risk averse. Uh, they've, they tend to uh, not like change. Uh, they're being forced for taking change uh, because of a lot of the uh, geopolitical, social, and now legislative type of activities going on, specifically around uh, what John mentioned, the, uh, the second bullet, which was the environment, the greenhouse gases. Uh, and from my perspective, driving change through automotive is not easy. Uh, it is, it's actually very challenging. And all of the things that we work on typically drive cost, but what we're finding today is that automakers are willing to pay a premium to meet these challenges because ultimately the government is enforcing, uh, uh, in, if, if they don't comply, there's, there's actually penalties for this. I'm, it, it's important just to understand where I'm coming from and my company. I have two or three slides on, on what we do and how we do business, and then you'll see how this all fits together at the end. But uh, we're basically uh, uh, in the metal space, so aluminum, stainless, uh, regular cold rolled steel, galvanized steels, high strength steels. We don't make these products, we purchase them and then we transform them into other types of solutions that add a lot of value to the automotive industry. So what I like to refer to as coil in, coil out. We have plants located throughout the Midwest. Uh, a lot of it, as I mentioned, is driving mass reduction. This is, this is a big part of my daily routine. We are the world leader in laminated metal. Uh, some of you may have heard of Quiet Steel. This is one of our flagship products, and I have a sample of it up here uh, that I'll talk about a little later. And many of our processes, of course, are very proprietary. We have a lot of scientists and R&D people that work with us. Uh, to develop all these solutions. A couple of the uh, technologies that we've just recently rolled out uh, is MSC Smart Steel. This is what we introduced at Great Designs in Steel in Livonia later this, earlier this year. This uh, material has won several industry awards, most notably the Automotive News Pace Award, which is an award given for automation, I'm sorry, innovation, in automotive, uh, it's a very prestigious award, and then the Altair Enlighten Award for lightweighting. It, uh, it is a laminate that is 30 to 40% lighter than steel that will spot weld and, and it will uh, allow equal bending rigidity as regular steel. So you can imagine 30, 30 to 40% weight save and replace steel is, is very attractive to the OEMs. And then, of course, Quiet Steel and more recently, Quiet Aluminum. We just launched Quiet Aluminum on the new Ferrari SF90 platform. Uh, it is, both these products are laminates. They bring acoustic performance. So the value proposition is eliminating all the damping treatments, the spray-on products, the peel and sticks, uh, and aftermarket Dynamat, these types of things that will be used to quiet down a body. They are, they are all these products are stamped like regular steel. We make them in coil. We ship them to all the major OEM uh, stamping uh, suppliers around the world. We actually ship these products globally because they provide a lot of, uh, of value to the value stream for, for vehicles. To do this, we have to work very closely 
with, as I mentioned, that risk-averse community. So up front, we, we employ a lot of engineers uh, that are face-to-face -face on a daily basis with the OEM vehicle engineering team, specifically the body engineering groups, the body in white, as we call it. And then uh, when, the, when the material is approved, and, after, and this process can take three to five years. It's very time consuming, especially because they are new technologies. Uh, then they are manufactured, and you can see here from the slides, this is the supply chain. So we are the, where it says MSC Engineering, MSC Manufacturing. So we're actually procuring these metals from the, the various steel, uh, aluminum suppliers, throughout the world, we laminate them, galvanize them. Uh, they're they're sh shipped in coil to a stamper. That's an example of what a dash panel would, would look like coming off the press there. And then ultimately it would ship to the OEM and be assembled into the body. That's where we are in the supply chain. Okay, so as, as John mentioned in uh, the second bullet, one of the emerging trends is, is of course the environment. And reducing carbon emissions is what it all comes down to. Miles per gallon is just a byproduct of this. The end game is reducing carbon emissions. So going back to the 60s and the 70s, there have been initiatives to improve fuel economy. But the, the reasons were different. The reasons at that point in time were more uh, oil independence or the price of gas. As late as 2009, this has now changed to the environment. And as you can imagine, there is a lot of, uh, when the government gets involved, now there are a lot of, there's a lot of pressure on the OEMs to meet these requirements. So what we're looking at here is there's a standard and then there's the actual achieved fuel economy targets. So if you, if you look at this chart, where the dotted line is, that is the target that these OEMs have to achieve for fuel economy. And pr the prior administration was very aggressive in raising this target to 54 miles per gallon by 2025 across the fleet. Now, the, the recent administration has taken a pause on this. They've been a little more friendly to the industry. And if you, if you look closely, you'll see uh, where it levels off and says proposed. That means that uh, they, They've, the, the, the curve sloping up now, those targets from 2020, uh, the 2020 levels now will be held through 2025. It's all being studied. Uh, there's NHTSA, uh, there's the EPA, and of course the state of California is also a very big driver in this. But these are what we call technology forcing standards. They're forcing the industry to comply with these, uh, or there are actually, uh, there's penalties for this, okay? So I wanna just talk a little bit about the enforcement, because this is why, this, this brings it all back to a very serious matter. Uh, as I mentioned, these standards really gained momentum about 10 years ago. Uh, and and to, from a high level, the. It's, it varies by the type of vehicle. So if it's a, if it's a, a passenger car versus a full-size truck, there are different uh, targets, as you saw from the last slide. And so at the end of the day, the OEMs will compare their results with the standards, and they're either meeting the target or they're not, okay? In the event that they do not, there's a very expensive penalty for this. It's $5.50 for 0.1 mile per gallon over the target, and that's multiplied by the number of vehicles you have produced. So it gets very expensive for this. If the OEMs beat the standard, they receive credits. If they, do, if they are below the standard, then it costs them credits, okay? So I thought this was very interesting, but at the end of 2017, this is the scorecard for all the credits on the uh, right-hand side. Okay, so if you, if you look at the top, you'll see Toyota, Honda, and Nissan basically have 55% of the credits that are uh, in existence. And from my perspective, this tells me that their vehicles are more fuel efficient, which makes sense, right? They have more hybrids on the road. Generally speaking, they sell, more, sell less trucks, less SUVs. 
So the middle of the pack uh, were GM, Ford, uh, BMW, some of these. These are typically more dependent on big SUVs. So the credits, they don't have as many credits. Uh, the, the OEMs are allowed to barter, sell, trade. So GM could buy credits from Toyota uh, and to offset with, with their requirements for the government. I did read something that the credits that Toyota owns, are they could sell for $2 billion. Very interesting. So what it comes down to is that, that bottom number there. A million tons of CO2 equivalent was emitted into the, this is just North America, from passenger cars and trucks in 2017. And this, this is roughly uh, one-sixth of the total CO2 in the entire country. So power plants and, and airplanes, other, there's other sources. The automotive industry is roughly one-sixth. So getting back to my part of this uh, puzzle is the mass side. This is where we uh, bring a very strong value proposition with a lot of our technologies. What's happening, though, is cars are actually getting heavier, uh, with, even with all these new technologies, and there's, there's many reasons why. One is, of course, the demand for SUVs and trucks, all-time high and growing. 65% of the vehicles sold in 2017 met that requirement either an SUV or a truck. We have more airbags than ever now. An airbag uh, typically is four to five pounds. And for example, an F-150 has six. So there's an extra 20 to 25 pounds. We have more cameras. We have, in the case of Tesla, you know, the battery in a Model S is 1,500 pounds. So there's more weight uh, in hybrids and, and, and electric cars due to batteries. Video screens, electronic modules, connectivity, emissions control, uh, noise and vibration, quieting the vehicles, and of course, all these electronics require bigger power sources. So all this adds weight to the vehicle. So what we refer to this as is, is mass creep. It's very often at the end of a development program, uh, there'll be uh, last minute changes to a vehicle and they have to put 10 or 15 pounds in to meet a safety requirement. Okay, so these are things now that up front we're trying to offset this. And the only way to do this is through innovation. New designs, materials, and in most cases these add cost to the vehicle. So what technologies are being used today to offset this uh, fuel economy target? You may be familiar, I'm sure you're familiar with every one of these. And in many cases, most of these are in production today. So with engines, we have cylinder deactivation, which is, which is very common, turbochargers, direct injection, valve timing. Uh, with transmissions, we have, you know, it's very common now to have an eight-speed, 10-speed transmissions, used to have four. Uh, CVTs, dual clutch with hybrids, uh, start-stop. Uh, regen braking, all these add efficiencies. Uh, so, so my point in this is how many of these are already on the market today? Are you going to put a CVT uh, or, or a four-cylinder turbo in a Super Duty truck? Probably not. The point is, is that weight reduction is one of these, one of these initiatives that in our perspective is just going to continue, continue to push the envelope, continue to look at new technologies, and ultimately add cost to the car. Uh, a couple stats here is that the, the industry has spent $36 billion trying to meet this 2025 target already. And once they hit the 2021 uh, target, it's gonna cost roughly $1,100 a car more to hit the 2025 target. Okay. So I'd like to just kind of reflect the past and what we see as far as today. So when, when I think of the past, this is my uh, 77 Bandit, which um, we were uh, very pleased to have. And I kind of look at this as the past. And back in the day, these cars were all steel, right? The bodies were, 
it's, it's not a matter of what type of steel, it was, it was how thick. And this car weighs roughly 3,600 pounds. When a new F-150 today weighs roughly 4,000 pounds, and it's very capable. Welding was the primary uh, source of assembly. Uh, and the way these cars were designed was with slide rules, and, and computers really weren't as prevalent back then. And if you wanted to understand how the vehicle was going to pass through a crash, you're going to run it into a wall. You might have to do it multiple times, right? Where today, many of these vehicles are using what we call mixed metal. This is a very big catchphrase in Detroit right now. Aluminum with steel, with magnesium, with high strength steel. All this makes the, the body more complex. We're seeing a lot more mechanical joints than we are with spot welding. Spot welding, of course, is still very prevalent, but we're seeing more adhesives and very complex rivets, self-piercing rivets, flow drill screws, things like this. Uh, as I mentioned with crash, you can crash a vehicle a thousand times with you if you want now virtually. If you want to substitute in a new material, you can run the crash test don't have to, with virtual. Don't have to run it through a wall uh, as many times as, as we did in the past. The, the, uh, in the past, we had our electrical and mechanical engineers, where today, the learning curve, and we're, what I'm seeing is there's just a very big shortage of talent. Uh, and this, the skills now to build these very complex bodies, I would argue there's almost a shortage of people. Back in the 70s, the OEMs made everything. Today, they are very reliant on the supply base to bring the new technology to them, as well as the expertise, the, the, the joining technologies. All this is very strong reliance on the suppliers. And back then, I think the decisions, a lot of the decisions to lighten or make cars more fuel efficient was probably on the competition, but also on the price of gas. Where today, as we heard, it's very much a legislative uh, driver, as well as a lot of the social and geopolitical drives. There's, there's other reasons other than just uh, the government. So from, from moving from the past to the future, the OEMs, this is very disruptive because their processes have been in place for many years, and this is something that's looked at as, as very disruptive to the way that things have always been done. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a few examples of, of areas that we have seen change uh, our, from, from our perspective uh, personally here at MSC. But the F-150, as you know, switched to an aluminum body in 2015. This was a very bold approach uh, to reduce mass, and it was primarily to hit these fuel economy targets. It's basically an aluminum body on a steel, high-strength steel frame. And this presented many challenges, as you can imagine. One being the interior cab noise. Aluminum happens to be a lot less stiff than steel, and, and uh, it's a third the weight. And this creates problems for what we call noise and vibration inside the cabin. Joining, there's a lot more mechanical joints in this now than there are spot welds. Aluminum oxidizes, steel, does, steel rusts, long term, but that can be prevented. Aluminum oxidizes within seconds after it's made, and this can impact joint integrity. The adhesives don't bond well to oxidized aluminum, so that all has to be treated prior to the, prior to the coils being stamped. All these, uh, all these aluminum parts, the coils have been treated with special coatings prior to stamping to lock down and uh, prevent aluminum oxidation. Another big problem is what we call galvanic corrosion. So this is when uh, aluminum and steel come in direct contact. And over time, there's an ion exchange between this. There's an, actually an electrical circuit created. And one of them is going to lose. And it's going to result in the, if you look back to the 70s, uh, when bumpers were falling off cars, that's because rear bumpers, rear steel bumpers, in perfect condition, that's because there was an aluminum spacer that basically caused it to rust out and fall off. So they were very, they were very, very concerned, and a lot of extra measures were taken to deal with galvanic corrosion. The aluminum mills, there were very few aluminum mills that could handle the volume that an F-series platform could handle. So I heard numbers as high as a million tons of steel went bye-bye. Went 
when the aluminum took over the F-150, a million tons. So you can imagine how many, how many uh, blast furnaces that is and how that rocked the steel industry. And a lot of these aluminum suppliers were, they, before they'd invest hundreds of millions of dollars in these plants, they had to get commitments that they're gonna stick with the aluminum for a long time. So we think the aluminum is here to stay. There's various grades of aluminum, and believe it or not, 6000 series, which is predominantly used in these vehicles, has a shelf life. And in the case of, excuse me, in the case of some of these bodies, it's, it's less than six months after the aluminum is made, it has to be stamped and, and painted uh, in, in, in the body form. So you can see all these challenges present uh, uh, a lot of complexity to the, uh, to when we go from shift from steel to an aluminum vehicle. I would like to talk about that item in the blue box because that's where we got involved. Okay, just a little history. So if you ever strip down any vehicle, you're gonna see behind the IP on a lot of the sheet metal, you're gonna see these types of treatments. These add weight, uh, they add cost, but they quiet the vehicle down. Okay, these are what we call damping treatments. They're on, on the left, that yellow, uh, those are bake on mastics, and that piece at the top on the right there is a, a foil back butyl. They all add cost. There's labor to install these, but they are for quieting the vehicle down. And of course, if you have a higher end vehicle, you're gonna have more of these, right? So this was a problem if you move to an aluminum body, uh, specifically through the dash or the firewall. And in, the, in a lot of the studies that were done showed that, that in the case of the F series, it was, it was eight to 10 inches of space was required to meet the noise requirements in the cab of the previous F series, okay? Because the, they, these trucks are not, uh, not always work trucks anymore. These are, these are very, you know, very expensive, high-end uh, uh, modes of transportation now that have very high performance targets. So this is where we got involved. So on the right is what an F-series body looks like. You see a lot of the shiny silver, that is the aluminum. But in, in the middle, that's the dash, and that's a greenish tint. Okay, that's our quiet steel. And it's been in the F-150 since this uh, truck went to aluminum. But it, it, in the past, it, it was spot welded in. Now it has to be uh, mechanically joined and riveted, okay? And if you notice, there's a green tint on that dash. That's to prevent galvanic corrosion between the aluminum and the steel, okay? So, th so I have actually a sample of this, and I'm just gonna hold it up, and I'm gonna give it a tap, because it's very hard to explain how this works without hitting it. So just bear with me here. Okay, so that is steel, it's, but it's two layers of steel that we bond together and it has outstanding acoustic performance. So it's very mass efficient for the truck uh, and it out outperforms aluminum in a, in a very high level. Uh, but we had to solve a lot of technical challenges around uh, mixed metals and galvanic corrosion for this. Another vehicle that uh, we or re, we are launching on now is the new Escape. This is a global vehicle for Ford uh, that all new, ground up, uh, that we'll be launching here very shortly. We talked about this example at Great Designs and Steel earlier. M the difference in materials on this vehicle, uh, the, the, the variation of materials, as you can see from the picture here, is quite, quite high. They're using uh, martensite, boron, dual phase, and different versions of high strength steel all throughout the body. Every one of those colors represents a different type of steel, generally speaking uh, from lower strength to high strength. So the, the crash sensitive areas like the B pillar, the rocker, the A pillar, these are all very, very high strength, 1000 MPA type products where the gray, the floor pans, things like this are more what we call closeout panels. But when, when they're designing these vehicles now, uh, the joining techniques, when they start getting this complexity, 
becomes uh, very sophisticated on how these vehicles in, are put together. Okay, so I, I actually have a, uh, right here is uh, a typical bumper beam that you'd see behind a plastic fascia. Uh, and if I'm going back to the, the 70s and the Trans Am, this material is roughly seven times stronger than anything on that car. All right, so this is roughly uh, 1,500 MPA in tensile strength, where the, and, and what that allows the automakers to do is go, very, go as thin as possible to save a lot of weight, but still have the very high strength uh, that is needed in a bumper beam. So where we got involved on the Escape was with the roof bow system. Okay, so these are the bows that support the roof from fluttering uh, at highway speeds. These are not for rollover. Uh, these are for what we call anti-flutter because the roof panel is so big, the, the air pressure actually causes it to flutter. Uh, and, and this new material, and I have, a, I have a sample right here, but this is roughly a 30% weight reduction over steel. And it, again, it looks like regular steel, but in the middle is a very, very thin sheet of polymer that is, we can spot weld through this, but it, what that polymer does is we take a section out of the, of, of the steel laminate and we substitute in the polymer, which drops the overall density of this by roughly 30 to 40%. So of course this does cost more, but in the case of these OEMs, they're willing to pay to save weight to meet these targets that I discussed earlier. Keep in mind, these vehicles are gonna, these bodies, they're very expensive to redesign, so they're gonna be around as these targets continue to grow, they have to plan so that they're meeting targets four or five years out. Okay, so to kind of summarize my, uh, the, the bullets here, uh, mass reduction is a big driver of more innovation in these vehicles, and this will definitely continue. Uh, as, as the supply base and as the uh, material suppliers identify new technologies, uh, these will continue to grow. Mixed materials is also going to continue. It's going to be very unusual just to see a steel car going forward. Vehicle bodies are going to, of course, become more complex, as we've heard. This will definitely be true. And the OEMs can, it's almost like a menu. They can pick how much they want to spend in certain areas of the car to save more weight and balance performance. And of course, all of this saving mass, it's now costing money. So it will continue to increase the cost of the vehicles. Okay. All right, thank you so much, Matt. That, so, you know, the technology that we're seeing is certainly gonna change the way we approach repairs, the way we understand how vehicles are constructed, and possibly the types of equipment and training and skill sets that we need within our business. Um, and, and so, certainly great information for us to, uh, to have a look into. But it's not just the bodies that are changing. There is a lot of other dynamics within the vehicle that require um, our interaction and understanding of how new types of technologies and systems are being introduced. I think it's the perfect segue into our final speaker for today. Speaking of another adaptation, we know we are a little behind schedule. However, I believe that this will tie it all together for you on how new technologies are driving home real world relevance in our area. So our last presenter today is Christian Rooker a managing director for DECRA Services. DECRA has a rich history in the automotive space, working with OEMs and working in the field of research. Um, his past experience is with Volkswagen in Germany uh, as a team leader, and uh, DECRA is also a proud member of SCRS. So with that, Christian, I'd like to welcome you up. So we are late. Now we have a speaker with German accent. Congrats. <laughs> Somebody wants to have a coffee, I will try my best to make it uh, worthwhile for you guys to, uh, to listen to it. Um, thank you first to Aaron to, uh, for the introduction. Thank you very much for SERS to have us here. We are very proud to, uh, to have this uh, speaking opportunity. Um, 
we have so much heard about technology. I bring it back to the ground a little bit. We, uh, they have the all the new technology, all the ADA systems. Uh, we just crashed something and see what happens with that. So um, <laughs> with that, I will get started here. Um, as Aaron mentioned, a couple of words about DECRA. You see the old photos. We are a very old company, founded in 1925. I don't go through every number. Uh, we are purely testing inspection certification company. Every penny that we earn, we reinvest in our company to acquire people and acquire companies that fit into our mission of um, providing and serving a, a world, a safe world, hopefully. Um, you may have not heard of us here, even that we are a big company. Um, if you have heard us, maybe we do a couple uh, supporting areas in uh, OE certification, so we, we support a couple of OEMs there, and we do automotive lift inspection, that's maybe where you saw one of my inspectors in your store, and we do a lot, of mo lot more things with the time effect. I don't go, go through all of that, you can look us up on the website. So why I bring this topic up here, so everybody talked about all the accident, every five seconds there's an accident in the United States on average, um, of course, we all want to see this number going down, even though that is, may affect our business. Um, but on the other hand, severity will go up, repairs will take longer, and there's a lot of other things going along with it. ADAS, ADAS, ADAS came up very often. That might be a new business model for you guys in the future. Um, when we look at that with all the technology, and I don't go into details because my uh, three guys behind me talked about all of that, so I don't need to talk too much about it. Um, there's so much going on. At the same time, this whole ecosystem, the whole process from accident, bringing back a car into pre-accident condition, there are many, many players that are touching that claim, touching that vehicle, communicating with the customer, insurance companies, OEMs, repairers as you are. Um, so ultimately, there are still always a lot of people involved, even though that we have systems that understand while an accident happened, that, that systems already start writing an estimate. Um, why is it important for us? So while we are embracing the technology as DECRA, we, we use scanners, we look into camera systems, uh, telematics, how we can work with the data, what we can do with it. We still wanted to check what is actually happening with a car that's not having all this technology. So is there, is there even an impact for that on, on the day to day? So at the end of the day, it's you, the people, that need to be able to, to put this car back in pre-accident condition. But what are some expectations to you as a repairer from the consumer, from the insurance company, when they see uh, a certain crash result from the outside. So that's why we have a, a setup. Um, my colleagues in Germany put together this crash test. So it's, it's an older model. It's an, a Mercedes-Benz uh, 2009 model. Um, then you see the barrier with, uh, with the trailer hitch. Um, and so that you don't follow the accent with all my explanations, I have a video that uh, makes it a little bit easier to understand. <laughs> I didn't do it. Um, so what happened, right? It's 6.1 miles, 9.9 .9 kilometers per hour. So I think me as a consumer, without having any idea about collision in the industry, I look at that, yeah, well, I have a dent in a license plate and maybe my, my bumper has a scratch. So usually I take a photo, send it to my insurer, get a quote, get 500 bucks, a check, and <laughs> that's it, right? And my, I, I even think maybe I don't even get repaired. I just keep the money and don't repair it because <laughs> put, a no, put a new license plate on it and it's gone. So now what you guys all, all know what, what happens, right? And if we take a look at a couple items here in more closer detail, you see there's a gap between the hood and the light already. So does it mean that the hood got dinged or is it just the, 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 
the light that went um, in a little bit from the from the kiss from the um, from the barrier. That's the first things that you already see. So when you look at uh, at the top, you see underneath the grill they are already the, the bigger dent on the on the bumper cover. So take a, taking away taking a closer look, you see there's a little um, a little scratch in the um, in the grill and then the dent obviously. But let's take away the grill and look closer. So you see the, the reinforcement bar really got dinged big time and then of course the whole cooling system and radiator may get may have gotten something as well. So if we go again one part closer, taking away the bumper cover, you see it's a really nice big dent um, from the trailer hitch. And of course, the trailer hitch was a little bit um, on purpose because we know it, there might be a, a stronger effect on that. But again, for the consumer from the outside, they don't understand, they don't see that. And they don't probably don't feel it when they drive the car because this car doesn't have all the technology, doesn't have all the systems that will tell them that there is a bit major um, issue with the car. So if we now compare a new part that the new reinforcement with the old one, you see from the dent, um, it's really bended and it's actually shortened the older part, which for that fact, of, uh, for that fact, it obviously pulled on both brackets on both sides. And what you see then in the next part is the actual brackets on both hands. You see that the holes are fitting not um, into each other. It's kind of dislocated for that purpose. So both brackets obviously need to be replaced. And then um, here you see uh, that the re reinforcement bar is, in, is, is uh, removed and you see that definitely the cooling system also got something. So and we will take a deeper look into that one. So the power steering cooling got a ding or got a, got a um, little bit deformed as well. And then from the push, obviously the condenser and the radio area got torn and have the issues as well. So more and more damage with such an impact of 6.1 miles is um, pretty incredible from my perspective. So then when we replace the brackets, you see on the left hand side that it's um, so due to the deformation, it's um, um, eight millimeters away. So we actually had to uh, work on the um, on the left rail to put it back in, in place. So we didn't, it, it became a structural um, repair, but we didn't have to replace the rail. So that was the, the, the cheaper part of it. But it had, to, it had to go on a bench, right? So we have to straighten it and get it aligned. And here you see actually the deformation a little bit better with the colorful picture. So, and now please don't start yelling at me, right? The Germans are crazy, 125 bucks flavor, right? I, I know that this is not the truth here. Um, but if uh, I did the mass in the background after I looked at the German estimate, so if we take an average of 50 bucks, we are still ending up at roughly 5,000 bucks of repair cost. And that different from a consumer perspective maybe an insurer's perspective that just sees the outside from the vehicle, they would never believe that. I mean, it's a supplement where every customer <coughs> freaks out when they come to the shop and think it's a, it's a small repair, but it's so big. But I think that's so important for us as an industry that we not only educate ourselves, but also educate our consumers, educate our industry partners in this industry, because um, these vehicles get so complex and you are in the boat of putting them together but you also need to be paid the right amount to be able to put them together and spend the right time and using the right parts. So for me, what it shows is really, um, even such a light impact can have such major damage to the vehicle with all the interior structure behind it. And again, the consumer won't expect that, that type of damage and um, what it actually means to his vehicle. So, and, so even if it just shows as a cosmetic repair, there's much more behind it. And, this, this crash is a structural repair that um, basically um, will have an impact on, on the safety of the future performance of the vehicle. And what that means, again, is I don't know exactly the perfect answer. I know that we as an industry have to work together to be able to educate each other and tell each other doing the right thing is important. Um, and disassembling the vehicle is, I think, the most crucial, crucial part of the whole process. So if even a trained and experienced um, collision mechanic, repairer, appraiser, whoever, nobody of us can see it from the outside what really happened. So disassembling the vehicle is the most uh, crucial part for that. And for me, um, as a father, I mean, I don't want to have my, my, my family going into a vehicle and maybe an Uber where something like that happened and they don't put the car together the right way and all of a sudden there's a second accident and the car is not performing as it should be. So I think that's, that's my message. 
I, as again, I don't have the perfect answer what we should all do. I think education, talking and working together, having associations like SCRS, supporting and, and embracing that is really important. Um, thank you for the time, listening to me, listening to my accent. Um, again, my family, I, would put, I wouldn't put it in a car like that. So thank you very much. I hope that brought it all home for everybody and the importance of what we do, why we do it, and why it's so important to understand the technologies that each of these gentlemen spoke about relative to the modern day vehicle and our, and our work on it. Um, we have another presentation coming up immediately after this on uh, access to OEM, documentation, information, and help and resources that exist in following those. Um, I hope many of you are planning to stay. We have many out in the hallway waiting to come in. So in the interest of time, we're gonna forgo questions on this session, but I would love a healthy round of applause for each of these gentlemen and the information they shared.